Hello and welcome back again. So this is a recap of what we have seen earlier. Um, this is the investment opportunity set or the feasible assets. So these are all possible investments and these can be combination of stocks into portfolios or individual stocks. Remember that out of all these possible feasible investment opportunities, we identify the minimum variance or minimum risk portfolio, and then we identify the portfolio that has the highest return at any given level of risk, and we call that our efficient frontier. Now, at that point, what we recommend is that we only invest in portfolios that lies along the efficient frontier. And the reason for that is because you will get the highest possible return at any level of risk when you're investing along the efficient frontier. So any portfolio along the efficient frontier is a well-diversified portfolio. What we're going to add to it now is the ability to borrow and lend at the risk-free rate. Now, this is an important assumption. Um, it's somewhat unrealistic, but it's not, it's not doesn't change the final results very differently. So most of us cannot borrow and um, lend at the same rate. So when we borrow, we typically pay a slightly higher interest rate than what we get if you invest the money in, in the bank. Um, but for very large institutional investors, such as banks, uh, that comes to very close. So uh, uh, again, this is not a realistic assumption for every single investor, but for the market as a whole, it only changed the outcome very slightly. Uh, if the rate is not the same, what happens is we'll have a slight kink in this line, but it doesn't change the overall results significantly. So to keep our analysis simple, we make this simplifying assumption. So if we make this assumption, what that allows us to do is then to create portfolios, not just by combining stocks, but by combining portfolios on the efficient frontier with the risk-free rate. So by having a risk-free investment, what they enable us to do is totally change our investment strategy. Now we can look at every single possible portfolio on the efficient frontier as a risky portfolio, because inherently, obviously, they carry risk. And there are many such portfolios, and each of these portfolio can have many number of stocks in them. You can think of them as a mutual fund, for example. But now an investor, instead of having to choose a highly risky portfolio or a, slight, or a slightly lower risk portfolio, so let's say this is a high risk portfolio H and this is a low risk portfolio L, um, they have even more choices because now the investors can put some of his money in the risk-free return and then some of his money on this risky portfolio. By doing that, he create what we call a complete portfolio. So in the complete portfolio, an investor will put some money in a risk-free asset, and then you'll put some money in the risky asset. And the weight between the two um, depends on the investor's choices. So let's say if you put Y dollar or Y percentage into the risk-free asset, then the rest of the money, one minus Y, the investor will put into the risky investment. So in other words, if you put 20% into the risk-free asset, you'll put 80% in the risky asset. So now we let, we are, this is called the separation theorem. We let the risky portfolio formation be done by somebody else. It can be a professional manager. And the individual investor only have to choose how much risk to take. And you can see that if I choose to invest in the high risk portfolio, let's say I want a risk level of 50%, I would do this combination. But I could achieve a higher risk return trade-off if I combine the risk-free portfolio with this portfolio here. And that portfolio is called the optimal risky portfolio. And in the capital asset pricing model setup, which we'll talk in a minute, uh, that is the market portfolio. The reason why that is the market portfolio is because every single investor will have the same amount of information. 
And because every single in investor with the same amount of information, they'll do the same calculation. They're looking at the, the, the same graph. Everybody will agree that this is the best possible, the optimal portfolio. And because everybody agree that this is the optim ris optimal risky portfolio, they'll all want to choose that as the risky portfolio. So all of the other risky portfolio becomes less desirable. And if everybody buys into this optimal risky portfolio, by definition, this portfolio becomes the market. Because if I say, well, if, when, once everybody is in, that is the entire market. So now investors only have to choose, make a very simple choice, and that is how much to put into the risk-free asset and how much to put into the market portfolio. An investor who wants less risk can choose a combination over here. So maybe 30% in the risk-free risk uh, risk portfolio and 70% in the market portfolio. Uh, a higher risk portfolio uh, investor can put all his money, meaning 100% into the market, uh, market portfolio and no money in the risk-free asset. A highly risky investor can choose to invest up here to invest past beyond 100% in the market portfolio, an investor will have to borrow at the risk-free rate. So he can borrow, say, $1,000 and purchase $1,200 worth or $3,000 worth of investment. So by borrowing in order to invest, it can go, the investor can choose a risk that is higher than the market portfolio. This line that combines the risk-free rate and the, and the market portfolio is called the capital market line. The capital market line is a graph where on the left, on the y-axis, represents the return on the portfolio and on the x-axis is the risk. And the risk here is total risk. So total risk of the portfolio and that means this is the standard deviation of the portfolio. So something very important to remember, we're working with portfolio here. And so therefore, these are all well-diversified portfolios. So the market de portfolio, by definition, is also a well-diversified portfolio. Now that you understand the risk return trade-off and, and, and the ability for an individual investors to allocate the investment between the risk-free asset and the market portfolio, next we're going to look at how does this affect the required return and the, re and the risk premium on individual stocks. So when we look at a single stock, um, the risk that we're going to use to measure is beta. So here is a line we call security market line. Security market line measures the, re the relationship between also risk and return, but the risk here is measured by the systematic risk and not the total risk. For a well-diversified portfolio, the two risks uh, has very similar characteristics. But for an individual stocks, remember that for an individual stock, it typically have a fair amount of undiversi uh, has a fair amount of diversifiable risk in the stock. So using total risk, using systematic risk, uh, uh, a standard deviation will not be appropriate, and therefore we use systematic risk to measure the risk of individual stock. So here we have the relationship between expected return and systematic risk. So let's say we have a particular stock, stock A. Stock A has an expected return of 20% and a systematic risk of 1.6. So this is this point here represents the expected return on stock A. Now, an individual investor can choose to create a complete portfolio using just stock A. It's not advisable because stock A is not well diversified, but he could. And the return on, and choosing between the risk free rate and stock A. So in this case, we have uh, a risk free rate of 8%. Now, every single stock provide such a combination or a trade-off between um, the return and the risk of the stock. So in this case, notice that the relationship between return and risk, particularly return and beta, is linear, meaning that this is a straight line. So we can write out this relationship directly. 
So uh, if you remember the, the formula for the uh, for a straight line, then you'll be able to write the equation for the capital asset pricing model. A very important concept in the capital asset pricing model is the reward to risk ratio. The reward to risk ratio is basically the per unit price or the per unit risk of reward. So it is defined as the risk premium. Um, so the risk premium is the return minus the risk free rate divided by the systematic risk. And if you remember the line that we saw in the last graph, so the risk premium is this part. So this is the return on the stock, 20%, and the risk free rate is 8%. So what that means is you get a 12% is the risk premium for this stock. So you get 12%, but how much are you getting, how much risk are you taking for earning this 12%? You're taking 1.6 units of beta, 1.6 units of, rest, of risk. So the per unit risk, the per unit uh, reward is simply the slope of this line. So we can look at the slope for the line, which is the risk premium, which is the expected return minus the risk-free rate divided by the risk of the stock. So in our example, the expected return is 20%, the risk-free rate is 8%, and the systematic risk is 1.6. So given a risk premium of 12%, we have, and the risk of 1.6, we have a reward to risk ratio of 7.5. Now let's take a look at what happened when the market is in equilibrium. And this is, uh, in economics, is very important because uh, the market is stable when it's in equilibrium. So just like all other products, when the market is in equilibrium, supplies must equal to demand, and the same product must sell for the same price. So a um, Using the uh, everyday items as an example, um, if you see that the price for gas in one gas station is $3 and another gas station is $2.50, that's a big difference, a 50 cents difference. A rational consumer will all drive to the gas station that is selling the gas at $2.50. Um, or alternatively, if you are uh, buying, uh, for example, you are buying milk, and if one store sells gallon milk for $2, and another store sells uh, a quart of milk for $2, everybody will go buy the gallon milk at $2 because you get more milk for the price. So the same is true for investing in stocks. Stock Individual investors want to get more reward for the same unit of risk. So in equilibrium, all asset and portfolio has to have the same reward to risk ratio, including the market. If one stock has a higher reward to risk ratio, meaning you're getting more return per unit of risk, all investors will want to buy that stock. And by increasing the, the demand for that stock, they will drive up the price. And if you have to buy the stock at a higher price, your return will go up because you're paying a higher price today. So, and that will happen until the market is back in equilibrium. So we can, rewrite, we can write the reward to risk ratio in the equilibrium condition, which is the reward to risk ratio in any security has to be the same. And that includes the market portfolio. So M here stands for market. And this is a very unique um, setup because remember that the systematic risk of the market portfolio is always one. So the beta of the market is always one. In fact, we standardize beta such that the beta of the market is one. And if you are dividing something by one, you can just omit the denominator. And we can rewrite this. So now we have the expected return on stock A minus the risk-free rate is equal to the system, we can multiply this, the systematic risk of stock A times the expected return on the stock market minus the risk-free rate. We can add 
the risk-free rate to both sides. So this will cancel out. And we have to add the risk-free rate on here as well. And now we have the expected return on the stock is equal to, there's a parenthesis there, the beta of the stock times the expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate. So we have this is the equilibrium condition, and this is what we have set out to do all along. What we want is a an equation that shows the explicit relationship between return and risk. So here we see that the return on a stock is equal to the risk-free component plus the systematic risk of the stock. So this is how much risk the stock carries. And then here, this is called the market risk premium because it's the difference between the return on the market minus the risk-free rate. And the market risk premium is the market price of risk. So if you take on more risk, you'll earn a higher reward. So formally, the capital asset pricing model of pronounced as CAPM, it defines the relationship between risk and return. And the graph that we saw, and this is a very useful equation that we'll be using over and over again, it, it enables us to estimate the, um, the required return on a stock. And the graph that we saw just now was the security market line, and the security market line, or SML, shows the relationship between risk, and risk here is defined as beta, and the return on the stock. So in equilibrium, one of the requirements is that all assets lie on the security market line. And so if you do the same analysis for many, many stocks, you expect that when you run the, when you when you plot them on a graph, all the all the stocks, all the portfolio will line exactly on the security market line. And the slope of the security market line is equal to the market risk premium. So this is what we expect to see. So here is the expected return on the market and the beta of the market by definition is equal to one. If you run regression and find the beta of a stock and the expected return on the stock, if the capital market pricing model is holds, then you expect all the stocks will lie exactly on this line. Now, Life, uh, real life has uncertainty. So you may not have a stock lying precisely on the line, but on average, they should, they should be very, very closely clustered uh, around the security market line. And in any given year, it may be over and above, but in the long term, it should lie exactly on the line. However, if you are able to find a stock whose, when you draw it on the graph, is above the security market line, then this stock is not correctly priced. And we saw that because this stock is not correctly priced, it actually will able, enable you to earn an abnormal return because you are getting a higher return than the amount of risk that you're taking. If you have a stock that is below the security market line, they underperform, it's because it's giving you a lower return than what you can get on the market. So if you are an investor and you happen to find stock that you are cons that you are confident is mispriced, you will want to buy stock that is above the security market line and you want to sell stocks that is below the security market line. However, if the market is efficient and the market is in equilibrium, you will not be able to find these opportunities. So that's what the efficient market hypothesis implies. You cannot use um, the different information set to, en to enable you to identify these uh, trading opportunities. So to summarize, Let's take a look at the factors that affect the expected return on a stock. The first factor is the pure time value of money, and this is the risk-free rate. And then we have the reward for taking risk, and the reward is measured by the market risk premium. So using the notation that we have seen before, the risk-free rate is our F, and the market risk premium 
is the difference between the expected return on the market minus the risk free rate. And then the last component is the amount of systematic risk that is measured by the beta of the stock. Congratulations, you have completed this module.